bit. So welcome to the International Manifesto Group panel on the crisis in Belarus, distinguishing cause and consequence in world con uh, context. My name is Adhika Desai. I convene the International Manifesto Group, which is an, really an informal group of, uh, of people across the world who have been meeting and discussing the fast changing a fast paced changing changes in the world that we have been witnessing since the start of the pandemic and every so often as today we put our deliberations on uh, uh, live and we also invite guests and, and, and so on. So uh, the, today we want to discuss the crisis in Belarus. The crisis has been going on for some months now and much remains very uncertain despite uh, the, the, the length of the crisis. And discerning the exact contours of this uncertainty is made difficult, of course, by the continuing degeneration of the press in the West, assailed as much by paucity of resources when corporate profits take precedence as by part the partisanship that the same corporate interests often require. At the domestic level, the protests continue and the Western press reports mass arrests uh, uh, even uh, continuing until today. But the overall direction of the opposition and the direction in which it would take Belarus are not clear, nor is the social basis and social identity of the opposition clear, and nor is it clear what, uh, what are the forces that continue to support the Lukashenko administration. Um, secondly, the regional repercussions are still being uh, defined. What are the real relations between Minsk and Moscow? How does Moscow view the crisis? What about the other regional powers, including Poland? Can we assume, for instance, Warsaw's support for a pro-Western, pro-EU opposition at a time when Poland itself has its own difficulties with the EU and is at loggerheads with the EU on a number of counts? And finally, of course, what are the perspectives of Washington and Beijing on this unrest? Can we, uh, uh, can we see a pattern of their interest and perhaps involvement in, in this uh, process as, we, as it has been unfolding? Ultimately, it seems that, uh, that Belarus is poised at, the mom at a moment of great uncertainty, um, uh, where the one option is towards a kind of some sort of neoliberal uh, financialized capitalism, which will li is likely to enrich only a small minority and is practically guaranteed to lead to the sort of social unrest that we are already seeing in the homelands of Western financialized neoliberal capitalism, whether it's in the UK or France or the United States or anywhere else. Um, or the other alternative is to try to build an alternative to it. But of course, whether it is not clear whether the, uh, the, whether the forces in the existing society in, 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 in Belarus has either the political resources in terms of legitimacy, trust, support, etc., for this option, or the economic resources to go ahead. So this is the broad context. We can extend, of course, the list of uncertainty, but this is the broad context of the present crisis in Belarus. And in the context of this, we are exceedingly fortunate to have a fantastic uh, group of panelists who I will introduce as we go along to help to orient us to what's really going on in Belarus. The next speaker um, is uh, uh, Yaroslav or Yarek uh, uh, Dobrzhansky. Yarek, you will have to once again correct me, I'm sorry. Um, he is a philosopher, a historian, and a specialist of Russia, a publisher, journalist, and translator, and he's based in Krakow in Poland. So if we can please uh, have your talk about 12 minutes, Jarek, that would be great. Okay, your pronunciation is all, was quite perfect. Jarek Dobrzhanski is my name. Thanks. And uh, so first of all, uh, let me thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Mm, because we have only 12 minutes, uh, I will go straight to the point. And the points that I want to make are two. First of all, I want to show you my own opinions about the current situation in Belarus, why my own private opinions and not just from the Polish perspective, well, because my private opinions and Polish perspective have nothing in common. And why this so, I will uh, try to explain later. 
And the second point that I'd like to make is to present how the situation is viewed from the perspective of mainstream media in mass media in Poland, both corporate private media as well as state uh, um, controlled media, and from the point of view of major political parties and major political actors. So, uh, uh, to begin with, um, I will try to avoid being uh, a lackluster ambiguous and uh, undecided in my opinions i will try rather uh, to uh, to be to to sharpen my uh, statements and uh, to hope to evoke a discussion to provoke a discussion so please don't be shocked if some of my statements might uh, might, might sound uh, strange or uh, perhaps uh, too extreme uh, to my mind the meaning the, the main question is the following uh, to what extent is the Belarusian deb debacle or uh, protest or a social conflict, or whatever you name you prefer, is a genuine popular movement expressing uh, grassroots dissatis dissatisfaction uh, with the government and the system as such in general? And to what extent it is, uh, if at all, it is a yet another color revolution inspired from outside? Uh, while at the same time using some uh, dissatisfaction uh, and some discontents in, inside the country. Uh, if the movement demanding profound changes together with the change of the head of the government is genuine, then the question arises how popular it is, how representative, who is behind it, in whose interest it is, and eventually who will benefit from it, from these changes, and who would become losers. Uh, this is uh, because this is hardly uh, a win-win situation where uh, the entire society will be extracting the same benefits. This is also hardly a clear-cut situation where it is easily, uh, where we can, uh, as observers, easily uh, decide uh, who is right and who is wrong. It seems that good reasons are split at the same time on both sides of the conflict, albeit to different proportions. Um, so it may be argued, and I will start from this point, that Belarus is yet another color revolution. If so, what uh, uh, can we, what, what can follow from this? Mm, uh, if it is inspired from outside by the so-called NGOs, the international organizations serving as front covers or facades, uh, behind which some well-known uh, government agencies and the operatives are hiding, and uh, NGOs uh, whose scope of activity is usually worldwide, but by some strange accidents, uh, they usually happen to focus only on countries who, who are hostile, which are hostile to the current uh, direction of the Washington government and to State Department. Uh, it is puzzling to be this coincidence. So if this is the case, then we can call it perhaps the hipster revolution. Uh, a revolution organized inside by a narrow layer of domestic upper middle class followed by young people aspiring to middle class status. Perhaps it is the second and final act of killing and finishing off the Soviet Union, which ceased to exist uh, uh, in 1991 when it was, when it was dis dismembered and dissolved, but somehow uh, it remained frozen in a microcosmic dimension uh, in Belarusian state, because some people believe that Belarus is a relict of the old Soviet system. Uh, in large measure, it's hybrid transition, the Belarus hybrid transition, which prevented Gorbachev style katastroika, as well as Yeltsin style uh, privatization or privatization. Uh, is a relative success story, which should not and must not be told because it runs, this history runs against the dogma that there is only one exit from Soviet system through so-called Western style democracy and market economy along the recipes of uh, neoliberal uh, shock therapists. Uh, 
if this is the case, then no wonder that the entire propaganda machine was deployed with its Orwellian methods of newspeak and double speech to hide the truth about current state of Belarusian affairs and to present Western intervention as benevolent, friendly, and basically humanitarian. I don't want, of course, to say that I endorse uh, the policy of Lukashenko, that I'm in favor of the Iron Fist style of ruling. Uh, or uh, in favor of government that lasts for 25 years, for a quarter of a century. But I'm also aware and I'm against the claims that uh, a well-organized movement of an upper class or a rebel, a rebellion of high bourgeoisie should be named the fight for people's cause and popular democracy. I don't know either, I must, I must admit, what is the best way to build a genuine participatory and all inclusive democracy in a country where there has been no strong tradition of popular uh, representation and which is under massive assault from within and from without, um, aimed, objectively speaking, against the interest of majority of the society, of majority of the population because the, role, uh, the rule by a self-appointed comprador elite is hardly progress, a progress toward democracy. Perhaps some basic historical facts are uh, needed here, because especially in the West, in the media, in the treatment of the Belarusian situation, are completely oblivious of the historical and cultural context, uh, not to mention the social and economic context. They are only interested in the Leninist question of, of who, whom. So first, we have to uh, realize that the territories of the present day Belarus has been in the past neglected and for a long time remained underdeveloped and backward. Many different countries made claims to these lands and different jurisdictions, different political jurisdictions over them have been established in time, in the past. These lands became part of the Russian Empire at the relatively late date and until the end of the 19th century were considered vulnerable and as such not worthy of any investments. Even the rapid state-initiated and foreign bank-sponsored uh, in late industrialization of the last two decades of the 19th century left these lands largely untouched. Situation did not change much from the point of view of economic and uh, social progress under Bolshevik rule uh, in the initial years of the Bolshevik rule. What had changed at that time was the political separation of Western part of these lands as the new Russian Western frontiers were shifted inwards toward the East with the rebirth of Poland after 1918. Under Polish colonization, to some extent, late feudal order was re-established with rural population most of mostly Belarusian stock subjugated to Polish laws. On the other uh, side of the border, uh, there were no major changes at the time either. The major changes uh, had taken place only after the World War II when Soviet Western borders were shifted, uh, moved to the West, and when Soviet Union was able to place along its frontier um, a group of uh, countries allied uh, with itself, the so-called uh, people's democracies, providing, so, so to speak, a cordon sanitaire for itself, a breathing space or whatever name you want to put on it. Uh, from that moment, a process of rapid uh, modernization, it is a paradox that from that moment, the process of rapid modernization uh, started in Belarus. Whatever we may think, of the Soviet economic system, of the Soviet style of rule, of the atrocities committed, especially under Stalinist uh, regime, the undeniable truth is and remains that for a large number of people of different ethnic and national backgrounds, it was an unprecedented progress in all aspects of, of life. We don't have time to, time to go into details uh, and to data and numbers, but uh, whoever is, in that, is interested in number crunching, uh, he or she will easily find the proper uh, data, even in the internet. So now let's forget for a moment, or let's forget entirely Soviet Union and the Soviet past, and uh, 
Instead, let us ponder for a moment on the balance sheet, uh, taking into account the following crucial moments. Uh, uh, Radka, Please wrap you? up soon, Jarek. Yeah. Uh, Please wrap up uh, soon. Okay. Um, so, these three crucial moments are the following. When Soviet Union was dismembered and new independent sovereign states were created, then the second moment, at the end of the first decade of this independence, of the separate existence of, uh, foreign, of uh, former uh, Republican uh, republics, Soviet republics, and third, finally, at the present moment, that is almost 30 years since the so-called uh, Białowieża Forest Accords. And please do compare uh, these three historical uh, moments or stages, the situation from social, economic, and political points of views in Belarus, in the Baltic states, in the Ukraine, as well as in Russia itself. Judged from the point of view of systemic political transformation, the Lukashenko regime achievements are a mixed bag and probably a failure, especially when you look at it from the perspective of integration with Western uh, geopolitical and uh, uh, global uh, economic interests. However, if we look at uh, uh, this uh, uh, transformation from the point of view of uh, uh, a more of building a more balanced and more just and more fair and more cohesive society it was a relative success and it has it has to be admitted the same can be the same can be said about economic dimension especially if we take into account Belarus starting point ukraine in comparison was much better equipped uh, uh, at the start, uh, and in fact, it was most it was destined to success, but it ended in a disaster. The situation of Baltic states, uh, sometimes described of, as uh, Baltic tigers, similar to uh, uh, Asian tigers, the Baltic states are in not no much better situation, even though they have been integrated into European Union as well as in the cooperation system of Nordic countries. And in many respects, the situation is even worse, especially from the point of view of demographic uh, uh, characteristics, to say nothing about the problems with national, national minorities in these countries, which don't exist, this problem don't exist in, 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 in Belarus. And I see that I have to conclude, so I'm sorry for, for uh, running out of time. So just to conclude, we are dealing uh, in Belarus with the clash of culture at present time. And this is the key to understanding of this of this problem, in my uh, in my opinion. Perhaps uh, during the discussion section, we will have time to to, to go into this deeper. Uh, so now I have to yield to my colleagues and forgive me for for exceeding my uh, allotted time. Not at all, yeah. Like what you had to say was very important and interesting. And uh, this is the typical problem with uh, these panels: is that of course we need to. Uh, uh, continue to keep things moving, but there will be lots of time for further discussion as well. So now I hope that we will be able to have Pavel back. Pavel, can you please... Uh, well, uh, uh, and can you hear me well now? I can yes. hear you very well. So very quickly for those who came in later, we are next going to no. have pa Pavel Katarzyski, a member of the Central Committee of the Left Party, Fair World. Uh, earlier we were not able to hear him very well, so uh, he will speak, uh, 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 hopefully, I think, from the start, Pavel, uh, of your presentation. Yeah. And, um, yeah, Pavel is one of the leaders of the youth organization of the Left Party Fair World. So, Pavel, the, the floor is yours and you have 12 minutes. Well, thank you. And uh, you f hear me well now? Yes. Well, um, well for four months, uh, workers, students, doctors, teachers, and uh, the entire working people of Belarus have been fighting against the dictatorship. During these times, uh, tens of thousands of people were detained, uh, hundreds suffered from torture, at least uh, six were killed by the police, and even more people were brought to death by other means. Uh, a wave of protests uh, began in May, but after a simulated presidential election, uh, which was held in August, the protests uh, entered in, into a new phase. 
the Central Election Commission uh, report that the dictator received 80 percent of votes and people didn't tolerate this spitting in the face. In fact, uh, the, uh, these were not elections, uh, but a special operation uh, of regime to reappoint of the dictator for the new cadence. Uh, all this is happening in the context of uh, destruction of social guarantees and increase in uh, paid services in uh, education and medicine. A fall in uh, real incomes of the population and the existence uh, of one of the most slavish versions of labor legis uh, legislation. Even now, during an uh, acute political crisis, Lukashenko declared the need to reduce part of the social guarantees that Belarus inherited from the USSR. In particular, it was proposed to reduce the time of uh, paid uh, parental leave from three uh, to two years. Uh, well, uh, since August, uh, there have been two attempts uh, to organize a general strike, which haven't uh, been fully successful. Uh, nevertheless, for the first time uh, in uh, two decades, independent trade unions began to form in factories. Uh, every day, more and more people join the strikes. Uh, I would very much uh, like to mention uh, the heroes of the resistance from the Grodna Azot and Belarus Kali Enterprises. I am talking about minus now. Uh, despite uh, that, uh, the fact that police regime are introdu is uh, introduced uh, in factories now, the working class continues uh, to leave the pro-state official union, and uh, workers are pushing for freedom for independent trade unions, high wages, and uh, dismantling of the dictatorship, and new fair elections, of course. Well, uh, the workers are also taking radical measures and three miners uh, chained themselves underground at depths of several hundred meters, uh, demanding the resignation of Lukashenko. Every day there is information in media about uh, workers who are joining the national strike. This strike uh, doesn't uh, have the character of outbreaks, but even the sluggish nature of the strike uh, has led to the fact that the administration cannot replace a uh, highly qualified specialist with uh, straight breakers and many enterprises are barely functioning. Uh, when, well, when I talk about torture and beatings, believe me, this is not uh, uh, unfunded uh, accusations. On uh, 10 of August, uh, me and uh, uh, some other comrades from Fair World, we, was we were detained and spent a day in a police station and three days in prison in the Russian city of Jordan. For about 12 hours, uh, people lay with uh, tight hands in the open air without food, water, and medical assistance. The police beat people just for asking um, where they are, and uh, I saw how they beat the disabled people, treated women with rape, and detained just uh, random bystanders. This practice unfortunately continues. Uh, now the police uh, can break down your door and conduct a search without uh, any official documents and uh, sentries. Uh, well, uh, these people don't wear uniforms uh, or some uh, insignia, uh, only masks and weapons. Well, uh, I don't know what you really see in Western media. In truth, I don't have enough time to follow this. Uh, but uh, I want to assure that all attempts to show a dialogue between uh, society and authorities are fake, and uh, all uh, confessions are remorse of the detainees uh, we obtained uh, through the torture. Well, uh, nevertheless, we are convinced uh, that the days of the regime are numbered, uh, and uh, they have no money to um, maintain the repressive state. Lukashenko now really is not president of Belarus, he is president of uh, police, maybe. Uh, well, the elimination of dictatorship uh, is only a matter of time. Nevertheless, our party understands very well that uh, uh, immediately after the dictatorship falls and our main minimum program is fulfilled, uh, we will again be forced uh, to stand in opposition and fight not only for democracy, but also for the social justice. Well, uh, that's why I'm <clears throat> uh, already at this democratic stage, uh, we are putting forward our transitional requirements, including economic ones. Well, uh, and finishing, I want to say uh, that um, 
uh, you may be interested in the prospects of this protest. And uh, I have to say that uh, now Lukashenko and the um, bureaucracy talking about new, more democratic constitution. Uh, I think this moment uh, of um, <coughs> transforming of regime uh, can become the end of regime because uh, uh, this uh, fake dialogue, uh, people don't believe this fake dialogue between society and uh, bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy police state. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it can be, it, it can sound uh, very sad for the left, but uh, I think now we have uh, the only uh, one question. Uh, the, uh, we have to choose now between the neoliberalism with dictatorship or neoliberalism uh, with a minimum political democracy. For, uh, well, <laughs> and uh, choosing between uh, capitalist uh, dictatorship and capitalist democracy, of course, our party fair world uh, choose the second option and we think we will have more possibilities and opportunities uh, to fight for the socialism and uh, real uh, democracy for all the workers and oppressed. Uh, thank you for um, your attention. Uh, hope everything was understandable. And uh, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, Pavel. Uh, Pavel has to leave. So earlier we had decided that we would have any quick questions for Pavel now because he will not be there for the question and answer session. So first I'd like to ask the other panelists if they have any questions for Pavel. I have a question. Oh, but, uh, Dimitrios, can you please wait? I am first going to ask the other panelists and then I'm going to ask the audience. So first, other panelists, do, do you have any questions for Pavel? Okay, there being none. Uh, oh yeah, Bruno, please go ahead. Yes, just I wanted to ask according to Pavel, what is the social base of Lukashenko? Because apart from police, I mean, there is the whole administration and uh, I guess uh, uh, it would be interesting to have that, uh, his point of view on the social base, base of the, of the actual mm -hmm. existing regime. Uh, th thank you for your question, Bruno. Well, uh, um, well, let me reply. Previously, the social base of Lukashenko was uh, teachers, doctors, and uh, all people who are working in public sector. But um, now it is really only police and administrations because uh, now, um, uh, teachers, doctors, uh, lecturers in uh, universities, uh, all the people who previously were, uh, were social base of Lukashenko, now they actively participate in protests. Uh, okay, uh, any other speakers? Uh, if not, Dimitrios, please go ahead. And I'm also opening the floor to other members of the audience. You can raise your hand electronically or you can simply make yourself known to me uh, visually. Go ahead, Dimitri. So I have two, two questions. The first one, two short questions. The first one is, if I understand well, the most probable scenario, if Lukashenko is, is overthrown now, it will be something like uh, Ukraine or, or Russia, uh, Yeltsin's Russia. Uh, does our friend believes this is a progressive outcome and it will help anybody in Belarus? And the second question is the following one. What is the property of the main uh, uh, industrial of, of the main economic units in Belarus now, and what will be after it, a, a, a change of regime like he 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 wants it? Uh, Dimitri, thank you for the question. Uh, it is understandable. Wait, uh, well, let me try to answer this question. Uh, nobody knows uh, what will happen after uh, dictatorship will fall. We never uh, know how the uh, we we never know uh, what will happen after the regime will be changed. But uh, I don't think that it will be same with Ukraine because. Um, the um, first point that uh, Belarus it is not so divided uh, into the east and west. Um, uh, the first uh, point. Uh, the second point. Uh, uh, as I know, at Ukrainian Maidan, uh, working class and uh, public sector workers uh, wasn't uh, representative as, as well. And uh, now we have. Uh, um, um, 
strong re re representative um, of independent trade unions and working class and public sector workers at the protests. Mm -hmm. Well, um, maybe it will be a bit same with Yeltsin Russia, but Belarus is not Russia and it is difficult to compare Russia uh, in uh, um, uh, 90s in Belarus um, 21st century. Uh, Why? Well, uh, what is the difference? Well, d uh, difference is that, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, how to explain it? Um, uh, because in the 90s, Russia uh, uh, goes through its own way with um, own model of uh, uh, capitalism uh, with uh, some, uh, any, um, um, well, um, uh, let me explain. We have state bureaucratic capitalism. As uh, I can see about Russia in the 90s, it was a kind of uh, South, uh, South American uh, liberalism, is for me. Well, um, uh, and now uh, about the um, property, in now and uh, maybe after. Uh, now, about uh, 50 persons of uh, property it is um, a state sector but it is not controlled by the workers it is controlled by state bureaucracy well uh, i'm very sorry and i can see the another question in chat uh, what can uh, protesters want liberal capitalism or something else uh, protesters want uh, new fair elections uh, nobody talked about um, some kind of uh, political program at least now and uh, believe me, um, uh, I am sure that you have, uh, you can see, um, uh, yes, protest without program. You are right, uh, the only point of pro protest program is new elections. Uh, well, and um, people at the squares, it is very different people. It is new faces in politics uh, because um, these people usually not members of um, uh, old opposition, they are no, uh, not members of uh, old opposition organiza uh, organizations. Uh, people demanding uh, uh, free uh, possibilities to uh, join uh, to independent trade union uh, trade unions, it is uh, almost impossible now. Uh, people demanding uh, fair elections, uh, of course they are talking about social stuff too, but um, uh, as I said before, uh, people are very different. It is working class, it is teachers, it is uh, a small bourgeoisie too, and so on, so on. So, um, uh, uh, the only way I see is to promote uh, left agenda at this protest. Well, uh, very sorry uh, <coughs> for this very short uh, and uh, maybe not very understandable. Uh, uh, no change uh, understandable uh, uh, answers, but uh, I'm really very sorry now, and I sorry. Uh, okay, uh, Pavel, do you have time for? Uh, there are loads of other questions. There are some written down here, and I have at least two people who want to ask questions. Do you have time? No, no not really. Very really sorry, I'm okay. missing my train. Well, I guess so, we will thank just you have to continue the discussion in some other way. But thank yeah, you very maybe, much for coming. And uh, have a good trip to Minsk. Yeah. Okay, folks. Uh, uh, sorry about that, but um, I didn't realize that Pavel had to leave so early. But anyway, we are glad to have heard him, and we can discuss uh, amongst ourselves in in any case uh, what he has to say going forward. So now I would like to go to the next speaker. The next speaker will be. Um, let me just make sure. Uh, it will be uh, Boris. Uh, Boris Kagalitsky, um, I guess I should say he's one of those people who need relatively little introduction. He's a Russian Marxist theoretician, sociologist, coordinator of the um, Institute of Globalization and Social Movements and the Transnational Institute Global Crisis Project. He is based in Moscow where he also teaches. So Boris, please take it away and you have 12 minutes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Radik, I will try to... Uh to answer some of the potential questions which I think Pavel, for the lack of time, partly failed to answer. But let me be very clear. Uh, if you are taking these uh, uh, almost 30 years of, uh, well, 20, 26 uh, uh, years of Lukashenko political career and uh, Lukashenko experience, 
uh, it's a very mixed bag. And this is very important. Unless we understand that, we can't understand anything about Belarus. And by the way, uh, also in what uh, Dimitri said, one uh, very important aspect of uh, Belarusian experience is that after 30 years of uh, uh, of uh, Lukashenko, well, 20, uh, 25 years, 25 years, but the, if you take the whole experience, it's more than uh, Belarusian experience, more, more than 30 years. Uh, separate experience, I mean, separate uh, experience of Belarus as a separate uh, country or state, whatever you call it. Um, so one important thing is that after Lukashenko period, uh, Belarus, Belarus is a very different society compared to the kind of society we have in Ukraine or in Russia. In that sense, there is no reason even to consider the possibility of things uh, which happened to Ukraine in 2014 or in Russia in 1990s being repeated in Belarus, which doesn't mean that things are going to be very good, that they're going to, to progress well. What I mean is that just you cannot mechanically um, expect the same experiences which happened in totally different uh, situation, in totally different circumstances, to be kind of imposed on a country which now has a completely different social, political, economic, and so on dynamics. So what about Belarus? I think the first 10 years of Lukashenko were absolutely essential in terms of practicing some kind of uh, socially oriented protectionism, uh, in terms of uh, Lukashenko managing uh, to prevent not only privatization, but which is much more important to manage to prevent the decline of industry, uh, which uh, inevitably, inevitably happened both in Ukraine and in Russia, not only because of their uh, privatization and marketization, but also because of the disconnection between different markets and different segments of the former Soviet Union. So in that sense, much of the industrial uh, decomposition, which has taken place in, in uh, Eastern uh, Europe, uh, is uh, due to a combination of free market policies and um, this kind of uh, political division, which also involved economic uh, fragmentation of, the, of what could be called some kind of Soviet uh, uh, common market, uh, which is absolutely essential. So in that sense, the policy of Belarus, Belarus was uh, not only to avoid privatization and to protect local markets, but at the same time to integrate as much as possible with the former Eastern partners of Belarus, so that was the reintegration, industrial reintegration. So that made uh, Belarus also very dependent on Russia. And uh, at the same time, Belarus was, Belarusian industry was diversifying its markets. So they uh, did a lot of uh, work to penetrate third world markets, former Soviet markets of third world countries. I mean, where Soviet uh, technology and industry exported um, their products. And uh, uh, to some extent, it was quite a success story. Uh, the price the Russian society was to pay for that was uh, that uh, wheat had to be extremely low, uh, even compared to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, employment was guaranteed. And to some extent, uh, that was compensated by the former Soviet uh, welfare measures, which were uh, retained in Belarus while they were destroyed uh, or partly dismantled in uh, Russia or Ukraine, not to speak about Moldova, for example, where the situation was quite disastrous. So, because don't forget there is a fourth country in this comparison, and uh, which is Moldova, which is the disaster, I mean, the disaster. Uh, so, uh, then if we are taking the last 10 years, uh, the situation is a bit different because on the one hand, uh, uh, that was the period of so-called multi-vector policy of Lukashenko, who uh, had a uh, reasonably, by the way, a feeling that uh, he came too close to Russia and Russia is definitely uh, different, uh, sorry, uh, Russia is definitely a very dangerous animal given the kind of leadership and the kind of oligarchy we have. Uh, at the top now, uh, so but the answer of Lukashenko was basically uh, to look west, 
so in that sense, it was so-called the multi-vector policy, uh, moving away from Russia as much as possible and try to get as close to, as possible to the West. But at the same time, uh, there were certain things he uh, didn't do uh, just to please the West. He had to do certain things uh, to please his own bourgeoisie, uh, which was also developing. And uh, during that period, on, on geopolitical level, as I told you, uh, Belarus was floating away from Russia and uh, to the West also because of the Western markets and so on. On the other hand, uh, that was a period where they introduced new labor legislation. And this is very important. This labor legislation is definitely the worst in uh, former Soviet uh, republics. For example, collective bargaining is not possible in Belarus, just to begin with, you see. There is no collective bargaining. Uh, and uh, all workers are on individual contracts. All these contracts are, uh, all, also only can last one year. So every year workers have to re, uh, uh, redefine their contract and so on. And finally, with the new monetary policy, uh, which uh, were introduced about, as, a, as far as I remember, about three years ago, uh, the situation started getting much worse in terms of, well, it was getting better and worse at the same time, because in terms of inflation, they did, uh, they did manage to, uh, to suppress inflation, definitely. So the Russian ruble is now stronger than Russian ruble, definitely. And so the, it was a tremendous success because one element uh, Belarus had to, one price Belarus had to pay for, for its uh, so-called success was uh, that inflation was very high. Uh, but uh, in the last three or four years, they rushed into the opposite direction. So they suppressed inflation. At the same time, they suppressed wages even further, as it usually happens. So they accepted very monetarist uh, neoliberal approaches. And uh, well, the Russian money is now, is now much better as money, but uh, they started dismantling much of the welfare. So that, led to this, that led to the decomposition of the original bill of Lukashenko. Because I disagree with Pavel that it was just the workers of uh, um, the public employers, or uh, the public employees, sir, of course. Uh, I disagree that it was just the public employees who were part of the um, uh, core, the core base of Lukashenko. I think, uh, especially in the first years, Minsk was always a position. Uh, Minsk was always very critical. But if you were looking at provincial uh, cities and towns, especially the same Gormel and so on, and if we were looking at the countryside, the countryside and the small towns were basically pro-Lukashenko methods. And they actually generated uh, massive voting for the, for the president. Uh, but ironically, given the su success of the original stage of Lukashenko experience, uh, Belarusian economy and society modernized quite dramatically. I was able to witness that. I visited Belarus quite a few times in the 90s and, uh, and recently and so on. And you can see tremendous differences. So uh, ironically, it was a success story, but this success story changed Belarus society. So in these days, the whole of Belarus is very much like Minsk, you see? Uh, it became much more homogeneous. And so this uh, original provincial and uh, rural base, which uh, was the core of Lukashenko uh, voting uh, success, it kind of disappeared or changed. It changed very much and demands were different people started uh, wanting, and they started wanting uh, other things, more, they wanted more, not only more freedom, but also more control and so on and so on. Uh, at the same time, the level of uh, corruption and so on was also increasing. So given the fact that we are now facing a global crisis, given the COVID crisis all over the world, uh, all that uh, kind of, uh, what's uh, happening, uh, uh, turning, turning all these different processes into one, you know, and all that uh, colluded. Yeah, and that produced this explosion. So finally, I'm, for my two minutes, the important thing, first, uh, Belarusian society is very different from Russian society. Uh, ideologically, it's much more to the left, definitely. And even, you, uh, well, there is a, a, a right-wing trend in the opposition, but it's much weaker. 
in uh, the uh, case of the uh, Ukrainian Maidan, the left was almost absent or kicked out if they tried to participate. Uh, in Belarus, it's completely different. So the left is quite visible in the, in the movement. Uh, but more importantly, all political forces taken together are maybe 20 percent of the protesters. 80 percent or 90 percent of the protesters are apolitical people uh, who are just angry and frustrated, and they will continue to uh, to act. Uh, foreign influence is very weak. With, by the way, Russia was also part of the story because Russia backed some of the opposition uh, much more than the West did. And that also made Putin very frustrated because it seems that Russia wanted to uh, frighten Lukashenko but not overthrow him. And they kind of went too far and they were by far too successful because nobody expected Belarus society to turn so much against Lukashenko in the society not some uh, NGOs or groups or, ca or the capital. Uh, Lukashenko was extremely successful in suppressing all the foreign NGOs and all foreign influences. Uh, by the way, Russian influences were stronger than Western ones, but even the Russian ones were under control. But, uh, yes. uh, but what happened, what made everybody so surprised, that the explosion was uh, times, many times much stronger and it's totally out of control. There is no one now who controls the situation, no one, either in Belarus or, or internationally. So it's quite an open story and nobody knows what goes, what goes on, what's going to happen next. Radhika, I don't hear you. Thank you, Boris, uh, that was great. And uh, also thanks for the timing, perfect. Um, my next speaker is uh, Mick Dunford. Uh, Mick is um, a, um, hang on, yes, he's Emeritus Professor at the University of Sussex and is at the moment a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. And uh, among various other things he does, he is the editor of a journal called Area Development and Policy. And I know he's recently done some research on Belarus. So, Mick, the floor is yours, 12 minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, the story I wanted to tell, I suppose, starts when uh, three of the leaders of uh, former Soviet republics, at that time they were Soviet republics, met in the forest near Minsk and decided to dismantle the Soviet Union. Um, you know, in 1989, you know, Gorbachev had actually spoke about Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok. And then from 2001 to 2006, Putin actually sought engagement with Western Europe, but in a sense was rebuffed. I mean, in a way, you know, what happened was that uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the arrival of a unipolar moment, the United States, NATO, the EU, headed by a newly unified uh, Germany, sought essentially to assume control over large areas in Europe and in, indeed in the Middle East that had formerly had close relationships with the, with the Soviet Union. What they in a sense sought to do was to establish liberal political, economic and ideological capitalist orders in which national sovereignty was overruled and in which essentially the core values and codes of conduct were the ones that were determined by Western, Western countries. You know, in a sense, it was a continuation of uh, 500 years of, of Western global domination, but extended into a new era after the collapse of the Soviet Union. To do that, of course, they, they drew on a whole range of instruments. Obviously, there was the attraction to many people of Western models, but there was NATO's war against Yugoslavia, there were color revolutions, there were strategies for European enlargement, there was uh, European association agreements, so a whole series of instruments essentially designed to change the complexion of a whole series of countries and essentially increasingly encroaching on Russia itself. So that was the first point. The second point, I just want to come to this notion that uh, Lukashenko is the last dictator. Now, basically, Lukashenko came to power, I mean, as others have pointed out, in 1994. When he did, he stopped privatization. 
He subsidized transport and he decided to preserve free health and education, and preferring, in his words, in his words, a somewhat adjusted Marxist-Leninist ideology over neoliberalism. And people have already documented the extent of uh, public ownership in the economy. And then in 1999, Belarus signed a union treaty with, with Russia. Basically, they envisage a union state of Belarus and Russia with a common foreign policy, currency, market, judicial, energy, transport, and communication systems. But essentially, after that point, uh, Belarus stalled. The third point I want to make is about economic performance. I actually have a slide which I could share, or I'll just give you the key figures. I'll give you the key figures, shall I? I can, I can make you co-host, but yes, I, I'll do Don't that. worry, I'll, I'll just give you the numbers. So Belarus is actually, the, you know, from 1989 to the present, the second best performing former socialist, former communist country. The top performer, is actually Poland, whose GDP in 2019 was 257% of 1989. But Poland, of course, massive foreign investment and a huge share of European Union structural and cohesion funds. Belarus, although there were difficulties in the last few years, stands at 196, 196. Russia is 120. Ukraine is 61. Extraordinary, 61% of 1989. Uh, in 1989, there was an attempted cover revolution in China, which failed. The figure for China is 1,449. 1,449. It's an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary contrast. So two parts with radically, radically different consequences. The third point really concerns the relationship between uh, Belarus and Russia. Belarus is essentially dependent on Russian and other loans, including Chinese loans. Belarus purchases oil and gas from the Russian Federation at discounted prices. Belarus refineries import cheap oil from Russia and then they re-export it at world market prices to Ukraine and also to Western Europe. Belarus also obtains subsidized gas from the Russian Federation. It then sells that gas at something close to market prices and it uses the revenue that it generates in order to support its social programs. Ru Belarus has been involved you know, in constant disputes with Russia, essentially about what they pay for Russian oil and gas. And to some extent, it's those disputes that led to this uh, multi-vector path. These intensified actually towards the end of 2018, you know, when over, uh, basically a uh, reform of the taxation system in Russia and uh, a kind of ultimatum was actually given to Lukashenko by, by, Med by Medvedev. So it was in this, in this context that Belarus had sought to develop a multi-vector strategy. And that multi-vector strategy was oriented, you know, as Boris has pointed out, you know, towards Western Europe. Although as soon as he started to engage with Western Europe, Western European countries sought to overthrow him in a succession of elections. But he also opened the door to China. And I'm going to say a few words about that aspect of this multi-vector multi multi strategy. Of course, in 2019, the Russian embassy, a Russian embassy was reopened in, 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 in uh, Belarus, in Minsk. And uh, a large number of uh, National Endowment for Democracy uh, projects were established in, in Belarus, designed to promote uh, regime, regime change. The sixth point, you know, Belarus, in order to diversify its economy, adopted a strategy of promoting high-tech parks and uh, free economic zones. Um, these, uh, some of these high-tech parks are of course uh, the places in which uh, people who have played a very active role in the movement work in many cases. And many of the people who service these, these uh, high-tech industries have also played a significant role in that movement. But it's very striking you know, that um, these zones, these zones, 
have uh, relatively um, low wages paid to people with relatively good qualifications. And actually the value added per employee is actually extremely low. They are not integrated at all with the Belarusian economy. They're basically doing sort of contract work, you know, programming work and contract work of one kind or, one kind or another. So in a sense, uh, Belarus saw these zones as being relatively unsuccessful in economic terms, in terms of diversifying the economy. So in, in 2010, Lukashenko actually approached China approach and asked, uh, because China has an experience of developing special economic zones. And they, they, they approached China to try and learn from China about strategies for developing economic zones and for promoting uh, economic development. So at that time in 2010, there was an agreement actually with Xi Jinping when he was uh, vice, vice president of China before he became the Chinese president to establish uh, a special economic zone 25 kilometers from Minsk. I have some photographs, but I won't show you them now. Your co host, so. No, never you mind. You can if you want. <laughs> so the, the, aim, the aim here, Great Stone, Great Stone is the, is the project. The aim is to create a new planned eco city for 250 to 300,000 people. It's a high tech zone right, with related services. It's. Um, designed to attract electronics, biomedicine, fine chemistry, engineering, new materials. It involves an intergovernmental agreement between Russia, sorry, between China, China and, and, and Belarus. The economic development strategy is closely allied with Belarus's 2020 and 2030 national economic development plans. And the aim is to perhaps double the GDP of the country within, within 10 to 15 years. This is extraordinary. Ambition. Okay. So there was a multilateral move towards China. Now, Russia has not been especially concerned about uh, the relationship between Belarus and China, partly because, in contrast to the European Union, China is not trying to pull Belarus into a new alliance that is actually hostile to Russia itself. So in the light of that, the last point I want to make, obviously you've then seen this attempt to promote a color revolution in, in Belarus. Um, my view, my view actually is that this uh, attempt to extend NATO, EU expansion, to embrace Belarus with the support of, uh, I think it seems to me, a minority of the population that will actually fail. I think it will fail, first of all, because it seems that Lukashenko contacted Putin. And it is quite conceivable that Lukashenko actually agreed to accelerate the completion of the Union Treaty with Russia. If that, if that Union Treaty is completed, then I think it becomes very improbable, you know, that the reorientation of Belarus towards Western Europe will, 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 will take place and that Belarus will be cemented into a different architecture. It's, it's an architecture in which it's quite conceivable to develop economic relationships with Western Europe. I think the second reason why it will fail is that essentially that unipolar moment is coming to an end. Eurasian multilateralism, so the Eurasian Economic Union, the Belt and Road Initiative, SCO, RCEP, are all initiatives which offer an alternative polycentric model that respects national sovereignty, that will, it will perhaps drive in the direction of uh, increased econ economic and political integration in, in Eurasia. And it seems clear that if you look at Russia itself, it increasingly sees itself less as being attached to Western Europe and more as being a center of Eurasian integration. Um, the last point is that, you know, I think it, it comes back, you know, it's something quite interesting is that um, Brzezinski, you know, once said that uh, Russia without Ukraine will never be a great power. And yeah, of course, uh, if you now look at the situation in relation to NATO, NATO has now declared that uh, China is a full spectrum systemic rival. 
but is actually its second most important rival after Russia. But I think, I think that uh, basically, you know, this creates a, a situation in which it's quite conceivable, you know, that, that Belarus's future will to some extent lie more with Eurasian integration than with integration with, with, with Western Europe and with the European Union. But that, of course, as I've said, it doesn't preclude developing win-win economic relationships with Western Europe. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Mick. That was uh, all very interesting. Uh, and uh, so uh, our final speaker is uh, Bruno Drovesky. Again, Bruno, please correct me if I'm wrong in your spelling, your, in speaking your name, pronouncing your name. Um, Bruno is a historian, a political scientist who studies Belarus and Poland. He's co-director of the Polish section of the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilizations, INALCO in French, at Sorbonne University and member of the directory board of the anti-war and anti-imperialist organization ARAT that was created at the end of the First World War. So Bruno, um, please, uh, the floor is yours and you have 12 minutes. Yes, so I'm, I just wanted to remind some geopolitical and historical context and then, then I will uh, try to explain what is happening now in Belarus and ex especially in the uh, society and in the left. Uh, so I just want to remind the fact that um, up to the beginning of the 20th century, Belarus was rather a very archaic country that was partly uh, um, uh, oriented toward Russia, toward Poland, and uh, in between all the time. But the real uh, uh, birth of, um, let's say, a Belarusian society, modern society, was a uh, uh, begin uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, just at the moment of the 95 revolution, and then, of course, on, at the revolution uh, of, of 1970, um, the both uh, Russian revolution, and what was also very important to, to understand why the Belarusian society is much more left-oriented than all societies in former Soviet Union, including Russian society, is also, the, 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 the apart from th those facts, the fact of that it was the so-called partisan re republic during the war, which, which created that uh, more, more or less one-fourth of the territory was liberated by Belarusian communist partisans uh, in, before the coming back of the Red Army. On the other side, we have the so-called Belarusian nationalism, which, which was always a creation of German occupation. The first German occupation created the People's Republic of Belarus with the flag the opposition is now waving. And the second um, um, German occupation during the Second World War with the same flag uh, the opposition is uh, now waving. And this is a, a, a symbolical, of course, a, a, a split in this Belarusian society, which is, which is uh, uh, also linked with the um, traditional orientation of the big majority of the society, which is rather left-oriented, and, uh, um, um, and part of the society, which is rather nationalist-oriented and Western-oriented. And this situation, of course, changed uh, recently, but not so much. What I would say for Belarus is important is that traditionally up to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, uh, Belarus was a, a feudal country and that they, uh, they changed directly from feudalism, very backwards of feudalism, much more backward than Russian feudalism or Polish feudalism, for a very backward feudalism toward real socialism. And this real socialism was something like a post-feudal uh, 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 socialism. And that explains to a certain extent what is the Lukashenko regime. If I had to define the Lukashenko regime, I would say it's a post-neo-Soviet identity regime under autocratic, paternalistic, and pragmatical ideology. The, the base of the Lukashenko regime was something um, like a no ideology regime, but with post-Soviet or neo-Soviet um, nostalgia, and uh, no party, no political party, what is especially no presidential party. And that's the point now is that can change in, in Belarus because Lukashenko realized that uh, the, the fact that he has no real party uh, um, in front of the opposition uh, didn't help him. 
Um, and the second thing, uh, the, Lukashenko built his legitimacy, on, of course, on uh, what was already said, on social and state-owned property. And in this situation, Belarus was, um, was in, uh, uh, in front of two threats. Uh, the, the Lukashenko Belarus. Of course, the threat of Western neoliberal uh, oligarchy or neoliberal bourgeoisie and imperialism uh, from the very beginning of the, um, the post-Soviet era. And on the other side, he was under the threat of Russian pro-liberal oligarchy that wanted both oligarchy, the Western one and the Russian one, they want to have a privatization in Belarus because Belarus is a very interesting economical uh, 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 point uh, for, the, for the capitalist, and I will explain that. In this situation, Belarus tried, uh, uh, Lukashenko tried to find a middle of the road way between West and Russia. Um, he developed very strong relations with different Russian regions and Russian uh, uh, different factories and enterprises or Soviet, post-Soviet, in the post-Soviet area, but also, as it was told, he, de he developed very strong contact with China, but also with Vietnam, with Cuba, with Iran, with Venezuela, with Syria, with Turkey, and up to the, uh, uh, the end of the Gaddafi's regime with Libya, with Gaddafi's Libya. All that in the purpose to find uh, alliances that could uh, uh, help is his middle of the road way and mostly to preserve the economical sovereignty of this new country. On the other side, he has quite a lot of good arguments toward Russia because um, uh, Belarus hosts the Russian military radar that is uh, used for the Russian fleet all over the world. Um, uh, he has, his factories are producing very necessary uh, elements, components for uh, Russian space, military, agriculture, mining, and informatic industries. And um, because uh, uh, Belarus is really, from the Soviet time already, a center of highly developed technical uh, te technology. Um, and uh, he preserved to a certain extent, the state-owned uh, uh, sector of that uh, of this um, of this um, uh, uh, branch, but in the other uh, side, uh, he let develop in, in Belarus a um, Silicon Valley style a private industry, uh, which led to the creation of a new bourgeoisie. Lukashenko thought that it would be a loyal bourgeoisie since it, it, uh, it um, cre was created under his protection, let's say. But now um, it appears that this uh, high-tech uh, Silicon Valley style bourgeoisie is the base of the opposition or what we call sometimes the Minsk UP Young, Yos, which is the forefront, the, uh, the vanguard and, uh, of, uh, of the actual uh, opposition. Um, so, um, we have to, uh, to understand, and it's very important to understand that the, um, the Russian oligarchy, uh, some of them, like, for example, Dmitry Mazepin, are even Belarusians, and they have very strong position in Russia, in the chemistry, in the chemical chemical industry and they are looking for and Mazepin is looking for the uh, to, to to take over the Soligorsk potash plant which is a very uh, world scale uh, 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 plant in in Belarus um, and he uh, financed quite a lot of the opposition uh, mm -hmm. in Belarus and we, and we have to, to, to know about that. The second problem uh, uh, state-owned sector in Belarus is uh, in front of is the question uh, that was never very solved uh, during the socialist time, the Soviet times, is the question of the efficiency of working, uh, working force. What we, we always know, of course, that the traditional Soviet style uh, uh, um, um, uh, system uh, had difficulty to put workers uh, uh, to, to work very efficiently uh, because they were uh, they had guarantee of, of work and they were they had guarantee of a minimum of life and that's the re reason legal uh, the, the, uh, officially why uh, in Belarus Lukashenko changed the uh, working law changing the um, uh, long term 
contracts uh, or a, a lifelong contract to much shorter contracts. Now uh, in Belarus, much of most of the workers have uh, contracts from one to five years, uh, depending which factory, depending their condition. But anyway, the aim is to 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 push them to be a, a little bit more efficient uh, in the factories uh, than up. normal Soviet socialist time. Please wrap up, Bruno. Pardon? Please wrap up. Uh, okay, okay. I, 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 I want to, to, to just to finish, um, and I will talk about the Belarusian left because it's important. Uh, we have, in fact, three left in Belarusia. We have um, uh, because anyway, that's fight. That's very right. Uh, Belarus is very left oriented, and that's even why you don't. You, you people are waving uh, the, the nationalist era flag, don't knowing really what flag it is, but they don't. Uh, wave a European Union flag or um, a NATO flag as you could or fascist flag as you could see in Ukraine for example uh, or in other country and uh, we have three left in fact in Belarus I told earlier that there is no uh, Lukashenko party there it was an attempt to create a Lukashenko party but Lukashenko didn't want it and it's just an association which is called Belarus but in but the the real there is one party that supports uh, Lukashenko in, 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 even if it's not the uh, uh, the majority of the of the regime is the Communist Party of Belarus which is uh, on the side and which which is uh, uh, trying to mobilize now on manifestation on the side of Lukashenko so that's the main uh, uh, pro Lukashenko left. Um, and you have also the, the, the anti-Lukashenko left Pavel told about, I, don't, I will ha not have to talk about because he did. And be in, in between you have the so-called Communist Workers Party of Belarus, which is a split from the Communist Party of Belarus because he became anti-Lukashenko, especially due to these anti-social labor laws. But now, and he's underground and repressed. But now, since the Ju July and August uh, um, um, uh, election and manifestation, he, he, he decided that Lukashenko regime is bad, but the opposition is much worse because it's pro-West and liberal. And he's supporting Lukashenko as a worse, uh, as a not so bad side um, as the opposition, uh, liberal or uh, social democrat, but uh, anyway, they say they, at the Communist Workers Party uh, in Belarus, they say, you know, the situation is the same as the left, uh, Polish left in the 80s. They were convinced that there is no capitalist in Poland, so there couldn't be capitalism in Poland. And so they decided uh, there will be no capitalism in, 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 in Belarus. And this, the Communist Workers Party think it's a pure nonsense because uh, imperialism can introduce capitalism, and especially you have capitalists. I just... Uh, uh, just one, two, two, two words. Uh, what is important from the crisis in, in August that Lukashenko is using now a propaganda he never used for the last 10 years. He's using words like socialism, Karl Marx, Leninism, uh, uh, October Revolution. And he told what is important. The only uh, difference I have with opposition is on the privatization. I will never accept privatization, and they do. And th that's his slogan. And now he's trying to build a people's congress that has to be uh, re uh, that has to be uh, in the next year uh, to prepare new constitution, new referendum, and after that, new presidential election. We will see if it's uh, uh, really uh, planned. But it's important to know that because uh, it it means one thing at least. Lukashenko knows that if he wants to survive, he must have a strong leftist uh, 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 orientation, not only for the Belarusian people, but he must show to Putin that there is, there is no way, uh, there will never be a Belarus under oligarchic uh, 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 and privatization policies, even pro-Russian, because the Belarusians are not so pro-Russians, they are pro-state-owned uh, sector. And that's okay. the base he wants to, to, to take back, I would say.
Fantastic. Great ending. Thank you very much, Bruno. I'm sorry to cut you off. You are very interesting, but we need to have a discussion as well. I, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and so what I'd like to do, we have at least half an hour, and if people want, we can extend it a little bit further. But I'd like, first of all, to ask the panelists if they have questions for one another. And then I will move to op open up questions to the audience. So, um, panelists, do you have questions for one another at this point, or do you want to just go to the open? <laughs> okay, I see none. Great, let's open it up. So, uh, members of the audience, please feel free to raise your hand electronically um, uh, through the raise hand function, which you will see uh, if you click on the participants section or uh, you can simply make yourself visible and raise your hand. Uh, but make be, be aware that I don't necessarily always see you because there are two screens here, so I may not see you. But uh, okay, Alan, you have a question, go ahead. You are muted, Alan. I, I want to thank the participants for what I thought was an incredibly informative uh, discussion especially since it uh, successfully covered a wide range of viewpoints, which is important in these things to be well informed. I, um, Dimitri made an analogy, which I think was in the forefront of many people's minds, which is the analogy between Belarus and Ukraine, Belarus and Yeltsin. But I wonder, especially after hearing um, the, the, the speakers, whether the, the, actually the best analogy is Poland, because what you had was Solidarność, which was a mass workers' movement that was not anti-socialist originally, which was in favor of democracy, which was clear that, you know, what we want is democratic socialism. And somewhere along the road, it went wrong. And it went wrong because it was captured, and it was captured because it did not have a left leadership. It had a good leadership, but it was not a left leadership. It was not committed to defend the social gains of the Polish state, such as the, the, the social services, the industrialization, and so on. It was not a committed against NATO. Had no clear, Solidarność had no clear position on NATO. It didn't understand that anything that moved to the west of Russia would be an immediate target for Western interests. Now, um, therefore, the, it seems to me and, it, and then it went wrong on what you have now is the Poland of today. Okay, Alan. And, and I don't think yeah. the Poland of today is better than the Poland of that time. I have to say that. So um, the question, um, is obviously there are kept, there's grounds to believe Belarus would not necessarily go in that direction. But I wonder if the best analogy is Poland, not Ukraine, not Yeltsin. Okay, uh, I'd like to group together two or three questions. So are there any other questions from the audience? Um, anyone? Okay, well, uh, there being uh, none uh, so far. Okay, no, Michael, you have a question, Michael Wongzhang. Please go ahead. Yes, um, uh, I thought, uh, like Helen, I thought that that was very, very informative and interesting um, uh, introductions. I, I like um, panelists to comment on the following things that um, with a lot of the um, the former Soviet bloc uh, countries, which, have pre which has previously fallen to the reintroduction of capitalism. Um, it's been clear that um, those types of regimes could be overthrown from the left or could be overthrown from the right. And we've seen that they were overthrown from the right, even in the case of Poland, that, that, that Alan has just um, uh, 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 reminded us of. Um, so I, I'd like to get more of a feel as to the, I mean, people have said that the, the opposition is in favor of privatization of state assets and, and those kinds of things. I'd like to get more of a feel of, is, is presumably this, the, the opposition is a movement trying to overthrow, overthrow Lukashenko from the right. Um, but I'd, I'd like a, a bit more in depth discussion and clarification of, of, of that and how it fits into the escalating Cold War uh, situation because people have, have uh, um, used the term color revolution. I, I, I'd like that to be clarified first, first of all. Are there NGOs from the West active in these situations? 
Okay, great. Thank you. And I guess I'll, I'll add a, th a third small point, which sort of dovetails to the other two questions a little bit. And that is that um, Mick mentioned that um, China is help, you know, was helping to uh, uh, expand and stabilize and make more successful the uh, technological paths and, 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 and special economic zones. So, and many of the high tech uh, employees of this are today in the opposition. So do you see a sort of irony here uh, at all? Uh, so, okay. And I know that Boris also has a limited time. So I'd like to ask Boris to go first and then the other speakers in some order. So Boris, go ahead. Well, uh, I think Alan made a very good point about comparing uh, Belarus with uh, neither uh, Russia nor Ukraine, but with Poland, which is a different, interesting point. Point though, I think it it also uh, it, it is good in the sense that uh, Alan shifted there uh, the emphasis. But I think again, it's kind of uh, missing the major thing. The major thing is that yes, uh, uh, the politics is something yet to begin in Belarus. It's not yet there. Uh, the, the mass politics, though so it is at the same time what is very important, and uh, uh, I think somebody claimed that this is a, a minority movement. The important thing this is a tremendous difference with either Russia or uh, with, um, with Ukraine, which really makes uh, sense uh, when you speak about Poland. This is a real mass movement, and this is very much a workers' movement. Uh, work is a quite essential element, uh, an, es an essential element of this movement. Although, of course, the first wave of strikes was first very successful immediately and then failed. Failed because it's not only, it was not only lacking left leadership, it was lacking any leadership. It's absolutely essential. And it's partly because the whole thing is totally apolitical. So the question is into which direction the whole process of politicization is going to develop. And actually it's, no, it's not a, a, something which we can answer because uh, it depends on people like Pavel and others, uh, how successful they are they and how much can we do to help them. Uh, and this is absolutely essential because we can uh, either fail or succeed. So it's an open story. I, I, I keep saying it's an absolutely open story. It can go both ways. Uh, anyhow, it's not going to get into the original direction of Ukraine and Russia for one very important reason. Uh, in Russia and Ukraine, the actual result of new liberal transformation was the destruction of industry. Uh, in Belarus, it's going to be different, which doesn't mean it's going to be good, because both Chinese, Russians, and Western companies, they all want to retain and develop Belarusian industry, because today it's uh, 2020 and not 1991 or even 2014. Uh, so um, given the uh, new wave of uh, kind of uh, uh, forced protectionism, which is emerging as a general trend, Western European capitalism needs uh, to increase its industrial base uh, inside Europe or, or in the uh, or uh, in the so-called backyard of, of Western Europe, which is exactly Poland, Belarus, uh, uh, and so on. And so in that sense, Belarusian industry is not uh, something they want to use just for scrap metal, but it is a potential, uh, potential uh, well, uh, gift or what a potential uh, uh, reward, we, something you can uh, take over and develop, but it doesn't mean it's a good news for Belarus either, uh, because uh, foreigners are going after it. Foreigners are going after it, uh, and if privatization happens, it's going to end up with uh, foreign uh, companies taking over. Ironically, this is a, this is partly potentially bad news for Belarusian bourgeoisie, because if they want to take over these companies themselves, they are not going to be. Uh, allowed to do that just because the competitors are much stronger. But this allows you to expect a much more interesting outcome that certain sections of Belarusian bourgeoisie, after realizing that danger, would actually be 
are kind of reluctant to support privatization uh, proposals, and this is already happening to some extent. The more uh, the smarter part of the Russian bourgeoisie understands that uh, it's not going to benefit from privatization. This is a very interesting phenomenon. So, uh, finally, uh, um, what is the country you have to compare Belarus, Belarus with? I think you have to compare Belarus with Russia in 2021-2022. With something which didn't yet happen and maybe will happen, maybe not. Uh, because the general trend is very similar. I think Russian society is now and coming to the end of Putin's era. Uh, it's going to happen anyhow, either through some kind of upheaval or maybe even through some kind of coup or uh, which is also quite possible be just because of the health reasons, because Putin seems to be unable to continue staying in power. So Russia is definitely uh, going into this post-Putin stage. And that means that uh, we have to wait for the moment when Russian society will or will not wake up. If society wakes up, in that sense, if it uh, follows the Belarusian sort of uh, trend, then ironically, Russia will be Belarus with the left leadership. At least some of the left leadership is. Well, I, don't, I, I don't want to say that left will be leading every movement, but only I want to say that the left will, the left leadership will be present within the movement, which is a big difference. So, you see. Uh, and if if society uh, remains uh, uh, kind of uh, sleepy and uh, repressed. And then the, the, it's the bad news also for Belarus because then uh, Lukashenko not only would be defeated because I think he's going to be defeated anyhow, but the uh, uh, the beneficiary the beneficiaries of the of the press will be not the guys we would love to be beneficiaries. So. Um, okay, thanks very much, Boris. I'd like to now go to Yarek and then to uh, Mick and, uh, sorry, Yarek, Bruno and Mick. How's that? I have to say goodbye and because I'm, I'm going to get Okay, off. thanks so much, Boris. <coughs> yeah. Okay, may I? Yes, please. Uh, somebody has already mentioned Poland in this context, that that would be the best uh, point of uh, compare for comparison. I agree, but it may uh, be understood in, in two uh, ways, as a warning sign, as a warning, or as attraction. Perhaps um, some people, uh, somebody said here before that Poland is now much in a much better situation than it was before um, before the Solidarity Movement, before 1999. Well, it depends whom you are asking the question. And secondly, we tend in the West to overlook the extremely high social costs that have been paid so far and that have not been yet calculated. And these costs are still lingering on. I will not, be, I will not go into theory here. I will just try to present this on two examples that will give you like first-hand experience what has happened in Poland with the removal of the working class and the replacement of a precariat. Uh, many people uh, who uh, don't remember the old realities uh, under real socialism, they just uh, are accustomed to think that precariat is something normal, that this is normal uh, to, be, um, to be paying a wage below minimum uh, of existence, that this is normal not to be paid a wage for several months in the row, that this is normal uh, to, to, to agree on so-called trash uh, contracts, civil uh, rights, civil law contracts between uh, employee and employers where no uh, labor law applies whatsoever and, we you, and when you have absolutely no protection because this is just a civil contract. And um, if you take, for instance, uh, housing, pro housing question in Poland, this is the vital question in every society. Uh, as you know, under the old Soviet system, the system worked in such a way that in a small, medium-sized or large uh, state, uh, city, there would be 
an anchor, a big factory uh, that would serve as an anchor for social and economic purposes. It was not only producing some things to be sold, but it was also a provider of a broad array of social uh, services, public services, beginning with childcare, with uh, cafeterias, with housing, with healthcare, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, after 1989, this was overnight removed. And imagine a situation when your parents or yourself, you are uh, working in such a, uh, a large firm, the only one in the city, which was then closed down forcibly, uh, not for economic reason, not because it was inefficient, but because the theory at the time was that, well, it stayed on, it's worth nothing, it has to be, it has to be sim simply uh, done away with. And now uh, uh, the consequences uh, are haunting you 30 years from then, from then now, because uh, you may happen to live in an apartment complex, in an apartment building, which has uh, the, uh, the owner of which was this factory which was sold. In the meantime, several people uh, have purchased this building because if you have some cash set aside, you can invest. This is called investment, you know, purchasing buildings together with people living inside. This is something that even Margaret Thatcher has not done because uh, she was actually trying to privatize the, um, uh, public housing uh, by giving priority to tenants. Of course, in reality, it looked differently because wholesalers bought this apartment and then made other uses from it. But in Poland and elsewhere uh, in Eastern Europe, people didn't even have this choice to buy this apartments, which during 30 years time have been dilapidated because, you know, nobody owned this building, nobody invested, nobody maintained it properly and so on and so forth. And now when you are 60, 70 or 80, you are faced with the situation where you have to pay credits because somebody who purchased these buildings 10 years ago took a credit in the bank for millions um, uh, secured by, by, by this real estate. And now uh, the credits were spent, the, the company are gone, uh, and the debt remained, and it is, uh, and you are faced with the debt, which is not I yours. Mean. So this is the situation which, may, uh, which the Belarusian people may face if they uh, uh, go the same way the Poland went. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry that, again, uh, Yarek, no. Uh, and Bruno, again, please keep it brief and to the point, but yes. yes uh, I, I just wanted to concentrate on the question, could we compare Poland and uh, Belarus at that time uh, in, in Poland in the 80s, 90s and Belarus now? And I just want to remind the discussion I had at the end of the 80s before the change of regime with the left um, oriented, oriented Solidarność uh, militants that created the so-called um, soci Polish Socialist Party Democratical Revolution. And they were uh, sure for that time that if there is a, a regime change in Poland, that it's impossible to have capitalism because there are no Polish capitalists and no Polish government will open the border to uh, have um, uh, 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 enterprise sales uh, under their uh, market value. So there will be automatically a democratical and very and ultra democratical socialism. And we know what happened. Um, and I think that the, the left in Belarus, which is against Lukashenko, is more or less on the same romantic vision um, that uh, uh, if Lukashenko goes, people are against priva privatization, so it means we will have a pure uh, um, uh, democratical system that will go toward, um, toward uh, uh, socialism. And I think that on that point of view, the Communist Workers' Party of Belarus is much more clever because he understands that even if they are underground, even if they are uh, 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 repressed by the regime, they know that if the regime is it falls, it will be much worse than under the Lukashenko regime. And I think they pay quite a lot to, to have the right to say so. And, um, and, and it's important. And the same thing, I mean, Lukashenko is very 
very clever in a certain sense. I, I, we, <laughs> we can support him or not, but anyway, he's clever because, uh, um, uh, of course, at the beginning of the of the events in in, in August, part of the worker was were um, were thinking about strike. Not the majority of workers, because if we look at a, a, a real sociological inquiries in Belarus, we can say that at the election we had two thirds of people voting really for Lukashenko and was one third for the opposition. Of course, the official uh, uh, um, 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 uh, rates were, were were falsified, but anyway, we have something like a two third, one third of the population. Uh, but uh, and but basically, a, a worker, a, a, all this Minsk at least society was shocked by the scale of the re police repression. That's mm -hmm. for sure. And some workers began to strike, but very quickly. Uh, 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 Lukashenko appeared with his minister and so on in every factories of the city. They went all uh, in front of workers. More or less, they said the opposition won privatization. You won privatization, and the, and the strike finished then very quickly. Because uh, I don't know what uh, Lukashenko thinks really, but he knows that if he's defending the country against privatization, he will have some support. And that's his strategy, and um, and that's of course the the, 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 the the what changes. The problem of the left in Belarus is always the same thing that Solidarność has is because uh, uh, sometimes uh, <coughs> money is coming from the West, and which money is coming from the West? Money is not coming from the extreme left uh, 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 working organization. Um, uh, um, money is coming from European Commission and European. Uh, 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 parties and, and, and structure which are uh, 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 more or less, more or less linked with, uh, with European Western liberal standards, um, and we have to be uh, to be aware of that. Um, and uh, second, I will finish on that. Uh, why would the, the, the Belarus uh, industry? be, uh, be um, uh, protected in case of a regime change. <laughs> that now the Polish actual regime, I, I'm not a supporter of the actual Polish regime, but they were told, uh, talking all the time, because they are supposedly populist, that they will re-industrialize the country. And they couldn't re-industrialize the country. The country was not re-industrialized because nowadays Western uh, capitalism is not for industry. It is a financial uh, 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 capitalism. The only thing we produce in the West is arm. All other things are produced in, uh, in low cost uh, uh, working class countries. Um, and Poland is just, uh, 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 the Polish success is just that some factories in Poland are producing components for German industry at low pay for low pay workers. So Belarus will be in the same case. They will destroy the, the, the Belarusian industry and they will ask a Belarusian worker to, 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 to produce components for German uh, or, um, or other, but uh, mostly German, uh, uh, big capitalist producer. We, there is no doubt about it, but basically now we have a strong crisis in the West, and that's why I'm relatively optimistic. Uh, 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 now uh, uh, the, the tiding is changing, and Eurasia and Asia are developing, and the role of China is may maybe much more important for Belarus than the role of Russia. Great, thanks Bruno. Uh, Mick, and then I'd just like to say uh, after this, there is we will take one round more round of questions and then we will conclude because I know there are some questions. So Mick, please go ahead. So, I mean, first in relation to these um, high tech zones, I tried to say that um, Belarus established high tech zones, but you know, the salary is only equal to the average salary in Belarus. The value added per employee is very low. There was no significant development of new new sectors. So in a sense, that path was seen as being relatively unsuccessful. And it's from these zones, but it's from these zones that a uh, significant number of the people who actually supported the opposition movement have come. If one looks at the, the Chinese zone, you're talking about something that is radically different in scale. 
you're talking about something that is oriented towards uh, new industries, and, but you're also talking about a zone in which it is essentially international investment that is coming in, you know, from China, but also from many, many other countries. So it's, it's, it's something you should differentiate really quite sharply, you know, from what happened in, in Belarus's own high-tech zones. I mean, Lukashenko turned to China, you know, on the grounds that China had experience of developing successful economic zones, whereas their own indigenous strategy had proved relatively unsuccessful and had led to the emergence, if you like, of some of these, these uh, Belarusian capitalists. So that was the, the first point, in case it didn't come over clearly. I think um, I found many of the things that people have said absolutely fascinating, and I was very pleased when Bruno talked about the positions of the, the, the left movements that actually have felt that you know this opening to the west would actually be ex extremely dangerous I and mean, leaving leading perhaps in the kind of direction that it led in it led in poland but i i suppose i tried i tried to say that in a sense that the cent one of the central issues you know over belarus in the recent past is essentially been will it be part of eurasia alongside russia alongside china or will it join Western Europe, the European Union, NATO. To me, that, that, that in a sense is, is one of the key issues that is actually involved. And that was why, why I said, I got the sense, you know, that, I mean, Lukashenko was put under huge pressure, you know, by, by, by Russia. And I'm, in, in, you know, that, that pressure actually, that pressure, of course, comes from the sanctions that Russia itself was subjected to by the European Union. But in that, in that situation, you know, the, a lot of these economic difficulties that Bruno talked about, the way in which he tried to address these issues of productivity and industry, you know, in a very interesting way. So, I mean, but Belarus does, does confront, you know, certain difficulties in sustaining this model that had been put in place because it did depend, you know, on significant transfers from, from, from Russia. But, you know, obviously, as, as Bruno said, there is this fear, you know, of, of Russian oligarchs and, you know, and already, you know, Gazprom, for example, has acquired much of the, which is state owned, of course, but has acquired much of the gas infrastructure in Belarus. So I think, you know, there, there are important questions about the direction in which industrial, industrial change will move. But I, I certainly think it's the case that if you look at Western Europe, it, it productive investment is very limited. I mean, if you look at a country like China, productive investment is still remarkably high. What Belarus needs is, is productive investment, you know, to build upon its existing industrial potential. So the only other point I wanted to make is that it, it seemed to me that, you know, faced with this uh, revolt, you know, Lukashenko turned to Russia and that Putin gave him certain guarantees, but I'm sure there must have been a quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo was almost certainly the union with Russia. And I, so I think the question then is, what does that union with Russia imply, you know, for the future economic and political development of Belarus? But I think that if he has, in a sense, conceded that, then it, it does mean that this question as to where will Belarus lie in a kind of Eurasian framework has to some extent been settled. As I said, that still leaves open a lot of questions about the way in which uh, Belarus will develop economically and politically from this point in time. But I do, I do think it's important, you know, to see that there is a contest really between different models of uh, international cooperation, you know, between the certain kinds of multilateralism that are concerned with protecting national sovereignty, and then a Western model in which it's essentially, you know, the uh, European Union, United States that want to set unilaterally, you know, the rules of the game for everyone. Okay, thanks very much, Mick. Um, I'd like to now ask uh, Danielle to ask her question. Danielle, are you still here? Yes, I am. Um, Thank you. Great. And is there anyone else who would like to ask, pose a question from the member, from the audience? Okay, because then I will put a couple of questions that I think have been left unanswered. So. Um, Danielle, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Belarus is obviously in a hard place between, stuck between the oligarchs on the West and the oligarchs of the East. And it seems to me that its relatively successful model of independence and anti-imperialist development with a social model 
um, that has been adjusted, as you said, since the Soviet system, uh, has been relatively successful, but now we're coming to an end to it in a certain way in just that if the model is only uh, based on national sovereignty and independence and not on a explicit social uh, basis, that is socialism, then it will have a difficult time surviving just simply ideologically because the uprisings that we're seeing today are be, are coming up because of difficulties of this ideological understanding of what's happening. And so my question is, Bruno, it's fascinating what you said about uh, Lukashenko now being forced, or perhaps by choice, but I imagine it's more by being forced to adopt some Marxist rhetoric. And uh, I'd like to know if there's any action behind that besides just defending the fact that we will not privatize the industries. In other words, is he uh, working on talking about re negotiating the work contracts that were probably so much behind many of the current uprisings and the difficulties of the split in the Communist Party, for example. And I fault Lukashenko for waking up so late. He's been there for 25 years. How could he wait so long to understand that we need to have ideological work done so that the population will appreciate its position, especially, especially stuck between oligarchs, capitalist oligarchs on the, on the left and on the on the west and on the east. Uh, how could he be so, so late and how so slow? And is he just kind of a fake Marxist now trying to use the, this rhetoric in order to stay in power? Or what, what does it mean? Thank you very much. Okay, um, I just like, Brendan, do you think there are any questions that, uh, are, uh, that are left unanswered from the ones you have been collecting? Only question that I see that hasn't been answered, I think, uh, was earlier in the chat from Anna Maria. And the question was just, can we say that uh, it is a revolt of the middle class for the increase of living standards that has halted? Okay, so that's, uh, is it a revolt of the middle class that is resentful of the halting of rise in living standards? And there was also, I noticed a question about the specifically the role of students. So if anybody would like to address that, and I, I just like to throw in one last question and that is, and for everybody, I mean, I think Mick, you've raised a very interesting uh, possibility that there has been a secret meeting between Lukashenko and Putin and that we may quite possibly expect the union to finally take place after well, decades after it was first um, agreed in principle. My question is, to what extent do you think that this, uh, and this also relates to the broader question of in which direction is uh, uh, Belarus going to go, in the Western neoliberal direction or in some kind of more socialistic left direction, etc. Now here the question arises, what is the capacity of the larger powers to do anything. I mean, it seems to me that if people could comment on whether they see the level of engagement, how they see the level of engagement of the major powers. I, I don't see quite as intense an engagement from the West as you see, saw in the case of Ukraine, but maybe I'm mistaken. Secondly, can Russia actually, I mean, what would be the difficulties Russia would have? I don't think it's necessarily going to be easy to establish a union between Russia and Belarus, especially given the quite distinct political and economic setup. So politically, you, Belarus is much more left-wing. Can Putin take that? Secondly, Russia is much more oligarch dominated, whereas uh, Belarus has a rather different model of capitalism. So what would be the outcome? And finally, one is reading in the Western papers, including in the financial press, that China is actually beginning to reduce its international engagement. It's lending less and generally Xi Jinping thinks that uh, it's time to sort of perhaps withdraw a little bit into China. They are reading the dual circulation announcement uh, in, a, in a certain fashion as involving China retracting. So uh, is China st still going to retain the same level of international engagement? Will it be retracting it? Will it be increasing it? Some commentary from, uh, from anyone who has ideas about this would be much appreciated. Thank you. So I think that will be the last round of questions. And uh, I guess Bruno would like to go first. So I will ask him to go first. Try and keep it 
to the point and brief, but of course, I'm not asking you to stint on your answers. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I will be, I will be quick. I just wanted to explain, especially to Daniel, what is the Lukashenko behavior and what, what, it, what it means, in fact. First of all, we must understand that Lukashenko, when I, th uh, when I said he is a pragmatical, uh, anti-ideology and anti-party man, uh, it is not only the man as himself, but it's, uh, it's something which is post-Soviet, because uh, when the Soviet Union and all the socialist uh, uh, camp um, uh, uh, collapsed, um, all people that were more or less believing socialism is the good way felt betrayed because uh, it happened that people that were uh, 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 so-called pure Marxist Leninism one day, the next day they just became pure neoliberal or pure orthodox or pure Catholic or whatever you want, but anyway, not Marxist anymore. And people were so deceived, they say, what? This party, this, this uh, nomenclatura, um, uh, um, with its purely uh, uh, ideological um, discourse, um, it was all fake. So at that time, uh, the normal logical re reaction was, let's be pragmatic. Because if we use, um, if you use um, uh, ideology, we will just behave like, uh, like uh, you know, the, the Gorbachev, Khrushchev, uh, uh, Jaruzelski, uh, Kadar, or, or whatever you want, uh, style of bureaucracy. Um, and it, 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 it doesn't fit. But, and so in, during all that time, Lukashenko rather was talking about a social oriented state. And only now he te he told in in a, in the in the speech that in fact his social and uh, oriented state is socialism, and then he began to quote Marx and to quote Lenin and so on and so on. Maybe it's demagogy, but I don't care if it's demagogy or not. It's it means that he understood that if he wants to be popular in his country, he has to come back to the fundamentals, and that's important. What, what will happen, I don't know. But the idea he he's tending to, to promote, now it's the so-called People's Congress. So now in every city, in every place in Belarus, you will have reunion of grassroots organization that will uh, work on the new constitution, a new system, a more democratic one. It's officially, uh, it's officially um, uh, 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 said. Uh, the question is, is this more democratic system, will it be a more social democracy, a, a more socialized democracy, uh, it's not clear. Uh, will it be demagogy and pure fake? Or will it be something serious? I don't know, you know, uh, we will see next year. But anyway, um, what is important for me is the fact that this is the discourse they have. And this discourse shows what real people want. Uh, 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 because, uh, you know, if you want to be demagogical, you have to, to tell people what they want to hear. <laughs> uh, and that's the base. That's the, base, the basic thing. Now, the question is that uh, Lukashenko seems to me more clever in, 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 in uh, 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 taking the uh, miscontent of the people than the opposition. The opposition was much more organized, two, three, four months ago. Now he, he took back the control of the, let's say, uh, miscontent. How it will finish, I don't know. But anyway, um, it's an interesting game, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bruno. I guess, Mick, would you like to go next and then Yarek? Um, okay. Just, I mean, in relation to what you said about um, China, uh, you know, I mean, I mean China, China remains very strongly committed to a multilateral international system. That's the first thing. Um, you know, with, with COVID, COVID has obviously had quite a considerable impact, right, on, um, if you think about the BRI, on BRI projects. And what seems to have happened is that there's a, a concentration on what are seen as being key projects. And in relation to that, I mean, the Belarusian project is one of the key projects. So that will continue to play an extremely important role. But I think the third thing that is very, very striking is that 
there's, there's a strong development, you know, of trade, international investment, but this uh, development of trade and international investment is now much, much more strongly focalized on, let's say, the kind of near neighborhood. Right, so in other words, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and then parts of Eurasia. And that's in part being driven, of course, by the existence of the um, trade war you know, with, with, with the United States. So it's, it's not so much of an, a, a withdrawal, it's in a sense of focusing you know, upon a, a smaller sort of geographical arena. So uh, that, that, you know, is an arena that in a sense embraces much of much of much of Eurasia and it also embraces interestingly you know I mean there's a big uh, uh, agreement being established between Iran and China involving very very substantial you know Chinese investment in, in Iran and there's been a new field really relating to oil recently with with Iraq so it's quite clear that in, in certain parts of the world, I mean, China remains very active and obviously it's got a strong interest in some of the internationalization of uh, some of its investment. So I think that's how I would respond to your point. In relation, in relation to what you were saying about integration of Belarus in, into a union with Russia, I mean, that's basic, basically, as I understand it, you know, the, well, the central issue is security. Is that, you know, Russia would not want NATO to be present just 125 kilometers away from Moscow. Mm -hmm. So this union treaty, you know, is in a sense, uh, first of all, really concerned with the security of Russia. Mm -hmm. The important question is, you know, in, once they, they harmonize, you know, transport and other infrastructures, which are part of this union treaty, what scope does it leave for, you know, the political autonomy and the political sovereignty of Belarus? That, I mean, that's, that's something which, I can't really say very much about it, but I mean, that to me is the key question. And that ties up very closely with what Bruno was saying about, you know, the political options, you know, for, for the future development of Belarus. But obviously that is obviously critically depends in many ways on the preservation of a certain degree of sovereignty, you know, in relation to the sort of economic and political course of that particular country. Great, thanks Nick. And yeah, you have the final word. Okay, thank you. Well, <laughs> first to the question uh, whether it is a, a revolution of the middle class uh, that you posed. Uh, well, it can be safely said, uh, I, I hope you will agree with me, that the answer is no. There is no middle class in Belarus. If it is a revolt, it is a revolt of the upper middle class uh, and of the aspiring classes or imitating classes, imitating people. And uh, of course, it's a revolution of heightened and perhaps unrealistic expectations, which have been also somehow with, with which the people have been imbued from outside. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if uh, to some extent or to large extent, this problem is of Lukashenko's own making, because uh, the state supported the, um, the solid educational system which was inherited from the Soviet time. The state supported good uh, higher education system, their research and development, and so uh, it developed um, uh, the sector of uh, high-tech economy, of communication inter and uh, information uh, technologies. It is not true that everybody in the sector is uh, paid low wages. Of course, there are people on, on the level, lower level of employment who are paid inadequate uh, salaries, but there is a substantial group of people who have made colossal money, even millions and billions, uh, and there is a, um, it is even calculated, it's 0.1% uh, of millionaires. And these people have been acculturated to Western style of consumption, and of course, they have acquired a substantial economic power, which is not corresponding to which the political power is not corresponding. So this is what they are after. Uh, if Polish case can be can serve as a, here as an example, as a lesson, then you have to take into account that after 1981, 89, there have been a successful, uh, there have been a succession of left wing or center right government until. 2015, when uh, right-wing, populist, nationalist, uh, uh, law and justice party won election and then repeated uh, its uh, success second time in the row. And this happened by no, uh, this is not an accident, because what happened in the meantime is that the left 
uh, parties uh, lost their constituency and the electorate shifted its allegiance to the right wing uh, formations. Uh, which of course uh, uh, promised to undo some of the uh, neoliberal reforms and so on and so forth. Uh, they reneged on these promises once they were elected, uh, making some kind of uh, readjustments which are not really uh, that all that important. Um, uh, another question here is what kind of integration? Because there are two possibilities uh, as far as integration of Belarus with the Eastern sphere of influence is concerned. One is, of course, a swallow up, swallowing by, by, this, by, by Russian partner and uh, emasculating uh, Lukashenko regime. And, but there is another opportunity of a broader, um, of uh, in bringing uh, Belarus into a broader structure of integration, of Euro-Asian Euro integration, where um, there is more, the, the relationships are more partnership, partner-like, and not uh, just the transmission belt from Moscow to Minsk, because this is not going to happen. You, to, for this, Lukashenko is too smart, and, and even if he's ousted, then uh, there, this is not in uh, Putin's interest to, to take such a, such a problem on his, on his, uh, on his back now. So this is how uh, I, I, see, uh, I see this. Great, thank you very much. I think we should probably bring this to a close, although I'm uh, always amazed to see that I guess this discussion has been so interesting that it has kept 40 plus people staying with us all through this. So um, thank you very much to all the panelists. I think you've shed a lot of light. We've heard a lot of different possibilities and it just shows how fluid in some sense the situation still remains. I mean, you heard from Pavel that the, the choice before, you, uh, before Belarus is between uh, a, a, a democratic neoliberalism or authoritarian ne neoliberalism. You heard from Boris that it's uh, between more or less democratic forms of social democracy. And Boris also sort of threw in for good measure a certain characterization of the Lukashenko base of power, which is kind of uh, essentially a bit a, a kind of Trumpian base of power in the rural areas and, 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 and so on, in the failing industries and, and, and so on. But anyway, these are all interesting points. And then, of course, we have heard from uh, uh, the other panelists basically about, you know, whether there will be a union looks according to Mick, anyway, there is very likely for security reasons, if for no other uh, union with, uh, with Russia, and therefore also a further process of integration with Eurasia, and also a, a more or less a, a general agreement among other panelists that the neoliberal option is not really an option for Belarus, which sounds interesting. Um, anyway, um, I, I, I just like to say thank you again very much. I think this has been fascinating, and who knows, maybe we will be discussing some further developments about this uh, in a few months or weeks time. And uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. We will bring this to a close and uh, please uh, remain, uh, you know, we will send you further notices of other events being held by the uh, International Manifesto Group. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.